All right, so hydrolysis is when you have an ion that reacts with water. Um, our process to determine how salts are going to influence our pH is to first dissociate it. So like that's when you write a reaction that goes completely in one direction. It's an ionization typically. And then look at what will wa react with water. If nothing does, the pH will be neutral. If you produce H3O plus, it's going to be acidic. If you produce hydroxide, it's going to be basic. So cations can either be create neutral pH, or if they react with OH minus, they can be acidic. So metal cations, um, like aluminum and iron we looked at, or also NH4 plus. Anions or negative charges can produce a neutral pH or basic. Neutral if they form a strong conjugate. If they form a weak conjugate, then they'll make OH minus. Okay, so why are some acids strong and some are weak? There's, there's a, just a couple of reasons for it actually, and they're all about the structure and how the charge is distributed over that structure of the atom. So here we have HCl, it's a strong acid. And you can tell that because when you look at this electrostatic potential map, which shows us essentially positive and negative charge distribution. So we would have a partial negative charge here. This is a delta, just to remind you from 141. And it's comparing with the partial positive charge on the hydrogen. That's because the hydrogen has a very low electronegativity value and chlorine is very high, right? I don't expect you to have these memorized. I would expect that you probably need to look them up. But in the periodic table, they're really far from each other, right? So hydrogen's over here, chlorine is over here. And so as it turns out, oh no, sorry, it's actually like there. As it turns out, the farther they are from each other in the periodic table, the, the more polarized that bond will be. And since this is just two atoms, the bond polarity is equivalent to the molecular polarity because the electrons are asymmetrically distributed. You have a very positive side and a very negative side. Um, so that's one characteristic of strong acids. When we look at nitric acid, which is also strong, we can see that most of the particle is neutrally charged. That's what green means. So green's in the middle. But where the hydrogen in is, is, is really, really blue. So we have this positive partial charge over here that makes this hydrogen really vulnerable. Anything negative that's anywhere near it is gonna snatch that hydrogen, including water, which is neutral, but has a high density of negative charge on the oxygen side. So that hydrogen bond is gonna be really strong between hydrogen attached to nitric acid and the water, and so strong, in fact, that this hydrogen is just gonna be like, ah, I'm not so interested in hanging out over here anymore. <laughs> and it just pops off. And so that is what makes these two things pretty acidic to begin with. In terms of why it doesn't go backward, we have to think about what you get when you take the hydrogen away. So what's the conjugate look like, in other words? Um, so like just looking at the structure, you can imagine if we took away this blue part, the whole thing is gonna be neutral. That's because you have a lot of resonance structures in NO3 minus. Remember that word, resonance structures? If you don't, go look it up in your textbook and remind yourself from when we were doing Lewis dot structures. Um, but essentially, a resonance structure shares the burden across all the atoms in the molecule, or many atoms in the molecule, and that also stabilizes things, okay? So if you have really polarized molecules, that's going to be more likely to be a strong acid or strong base. Um, but also, if the conjugate that you produce is very stable because of resonance or because they have a high electronegativity, so they can bear a negative charge, then it's likely you're going to have a strong acid. Okay? Um, so that's what this bullet's about. A strong acid or a strong base has a stable conjugate, either from resonance or from having a high electronegativity, if it's a single atom like chlorine.
Okay. So when you're thinking about the conjugate, you could either have a large particle with a small charge like Cl minus, right? It's pretty big, but it has a negative charge and it's distributed over the entire thing, which is okay because chlorine likes negative charge. Or like NO3 minus, it might have multiple resonance structures to stabilize it. So looking down the group 17, the halogens, we see that hydrochloric acid is the first strong acid, hydrobromic is the second, and hydroiodic is the third. Um, chlorine is much bigger than fluorine is, and so it can stabilize that negative charge far better than chlorine can which means the amount of energy required to break hydrogen and chlorine apart is pretty small compared to hydrogen and fluorine. So down that row, hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid. Chloric, bromic, and iodic are strong acids because they get progressively larger anions to stabilize those negative charges. Um, that does not mean that hydrofluoric acid is safer Okay, it is not actually. Hydrofluoric acid's reactivity is very different than um, these three. They're all very reactive, but as it turns out, hydrofluoric is so reactive, you have to store it in a very special plastic. There's only one kind of plastic that does not react with the hydrofluoric. And so it's highly regulated. It's very hard to buy. You have to have permits and all this stuff, and it's expensive to ship. Um, because it is really re reactive. So being a weak acid does not mean non-reactive. It just means there's less hydrogen floating around in the solution. Okay. So kind of as a general trend, when we're going down group 17, you see HF, I'm going to move my face. That's not a phrase you would have heard before COVID, right? Okay, so I'm gonna, HF is the weakest, and as we go down the line, HI is down here, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. The same thing is true in column 16 in your periodic table. Um, oxygen isn't, water is amphiprotic and can be an acid and a base. It's kind of in between these two. But as we go down that column, it gets increasingly higher Ka values. So the one below this is going to be even higher as a, as a weak acid. So that's a general trend you can use. Group 15 tends to be bases because you have lone pairs of electrons to accept a hydrogen on. But the higher, the stronger, the stronger weak bases are going to be located at the top and they get weaker and weaker as they go down. Group 14 does not have acid or base characteristics because they don't have any electrons to share and they don't particularly like to hold electrons from other places. So they tend to form covalent compounds. Okay. So our polyatomic acids are fun because like sulfuric acid shown here has two hydrogens on it that are connected to oxygens. And so they're acidic because the, the sulfur oxygen bond is quite strong and it's pulling electron density towards the oxygen and the sulfur and away from the hydrogen. So these are very, very positive. Um, and one of the reasons that it has two hydrogen is because it can stabilize the charge because it has all this oxygen around. But if you, if you cut off one of these, then you have three resonance structures to stabilize the double bond that's going to form between oxygen and sulfur. Um, and then if you cut off the other one, you have a lot of resonance structures. I think it's like nine in order to stabilize all the different, um, the, you're gonna have two double bonds distributed over these four oxygens. And so you can do that in a lot of different ways, which makes sulfate a very stable ion also. All right, now, so hydro, sulfuric acid is special because the first hydrogen that it loses is strong. But once you form HSO4, that is going to want to hang on to its hydrogen a little bit more so it's not a strong acid anymore. Just losing the first proton is strong, okay? In all cases, even if it's a weak acid to begin with, like citric acid or ascorbic acid, losing that first proton is the easiest one to lose. It's gonna produce a negative charge though so it's going to be harder to give up a positive charge if you're asking that molecule to bear an even bigger negative charge. So Ka1 is always lower than Ka2. And if there's a third one to lose, that's going to be the, the lowest of all. So like phosphoric acid, for example, 
has three Ka's, one, two, three in the back, that's our other H. And you do get resonance structures when you lose each one, but because you're increasing the charge on the molecule, it makes it harder and harder and harder to steal hydrogens from it. All right. So if you think about like a Cl connected to an OH, we call this hypochlorous acid. Um, the Cl has an electronegativity value of three and it has a Ka of about 10 to the negative eight. As we go down in electronegativity value, okay, we see that that exponent, this Ka gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the bigger the, K, the electronegativity difference is between um, the chlorine and the oxygen or the bromine and the oxygen or the, you know, so on. The bigger that difference is, um, the higher the Ka is going to be, which makes sense because you have more of a blue area on the electrostatic map. All right, so, oh, that brings us to the answer the question of why don't we just give up a hydroxide, right? Because like in the case of phosphoric acid, what you actually have is like three OHs hanging off like that. And so people will be like, well, why doesn't the o OP bond break? And the answer to that is that the OH bond is weaker as you pull electron density closer to the phosphorus because it is more and more electronegative um, as you change these center compounds here, that's pulling the oxygen closer and closer because they don't have as big of a value a electronegativity difference. And that makes this bond weaker. Okay, so anytime you're pulling electron density away from the hydrogen, it's going to mean that's more and more acidic. Breaking a PO bond takes much more energy than breaking an OH bond does. Okay, so instead, the OH bond is what's going to get broken because it has the lowest sort of difference, right? It's also because H is very small, whereas P and O are pretty big, so you're going to have a lot of orbital overlap between these two. So, in summary, we can't take an OH away from the polyatomic acids because the electronegativity of the center atom is too strong. That connection between, so P and O or S and O is too strong to break it. So instead, the H plus breaks off. Um, when that happens, you get a lot of resonance structures and that stabilizes the conjugate acid. Sulfuric acid, for example, has a first proton that's strong, and then subsequently the second proton is weak. Phosphoric is all weak, actually, but um, sometimes that first one is stronger, strong enough to be a strong acid. The first proton is always going to have the highest Ka, even if they're all weak. The second will have the next highest, and the third is the lowest. 